there will be this world without you. One day, OK Supermarket will be opening to new customers. <laughs> you will not be there to buy their new products. And this is how God has designed this world. It is weakness, it is folly for you to assume that all these things that are in the world today, they are meant for you alone. But even though this world may remain after you have gone, you also need to remember that there is going to be a day when this world will eventually come to an end. Everyone will be required to appear before Christ and Christ will pronounce a verdict that is going to result in others going to heaven with him and others will be cast out of the presence of God to burn forever in the lake that burns with sulfur and brimstone that is called the lake of fire. So this evening I am going to share a very particular message. It is called the Book of Life. It is titled the Book of Life. There are so many scriptures that we are going to be using if our weather allows us. And we are also going to see some images on that screen. We are going to use those images to understand the gospel, but not now. What we want to do now is to remind you, because we have said this so many times before. It is not the first time sharing with you such information. This world is not... Uh, going to abide forever. We are going to lose this world. It is going to come to an end. And there are others amongst us who have been taught that when judgment happens, Jesus is not going to go back to heaven. He is going to establish his kingdom here on earth. And there are others who have taught us that the wicked are the ones who are going to be put into the lake of fire. The righteous ones, they are going to enjoy the new technology. They are going to enjoy Wi-Fi, 5G network, virtual technology in the earth. And that is going to be eternal life. There are churches which teach that eternal life is not going to happen in heaven. It is going to happen here on earth. They misquote scriptures like Revelation chapter 21, which talk about the coming down of new heaven and the new earth. Before I go into a lot of scriptures that are going to give us the directions concerning today's message, I am going to, with the help of the scriptures that I'm going to cite from the Bible. I am going to refat, to expel with all emphasis the teaching that has come into our midst, which says there is no heaven. Heaven is going to happen here on earth. There are churches which have brought forth that teaching. One of them is the Jehovah's Witness which was founded by Charles Taze Russell. Not only do they believe that there is no heaven to go to, they also believe that Jesus is not God, but Michael, the archangel. They say we are going to live here on earth perpetually, but that is not true. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints which was founded by Joseph Smith in America. It also teaches that there is no heaven to go to. But once people that are in that cult have died, they will go to 
there are allocations of planets where they are going to play God in those planets. They are going to populate those planets with their Mormon children. That is why if you are attending that cult, Mormonism, Church of Jesus Christ of later day saints, the one that is running that shop there, Switch in, uh, Internet Cafe, it is run by the cultists of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. A very rich cult it is. Yes. It owns a lot of expensive buildings across the world. One of their expensive churches is in islands there. They teach their congregants that you cannot marry someone who is not part of that cult. The reason being, if you die, you have to go to that planet with your, with your wife. But that wife must be part of the cult. So if you are to marry a girl from the Church of Jesus Christ of Later Day Saints, you will be required to marry a, 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 a girl if you are part of the cult. Or if you are a boy, you will not walk out of the church to find a wife. Because they, they believe that if they die, there is an allocated planet which they are going to go with their spiritual wives who once were mortals. They are going to bring forth children and populate those planets. The name the Church of Jesus Christ of Later Day Saints is actually a deceptive name. Because they teach nothing about Jesus in that, in that cult. Yes. They don't even believe in this Bible. They don't read it. Theirs is not called the Bible. It is called the Book of Mormon. The reason why our Africans are attending these cults, it is because they are so much philanthropic works, charitable works that these cults do. They send children who are finding it difficult to go to school. Their parents cannot afford. These cults will opt, they will volunteer to pay for their children's education. They give out food hampers. They will pay for your medical expenses if you fall sick, free of charge. They have built free basketball pitches, football grounds, so that you can go and play soccer and improve your skills, pay adventure, you will become a football star and make money. Because of those free gifts, people have been deceived into believing that it is indeed the Church of Jesus Christ. I've just mentioned the two cults which do not agree with the teaching in the Bible, which says if we are done with this world, there will be a heaven to go to. They say we don't go to heaven. We will live in certain planets above the earth. That is the Mormons. And the Jehovah's Witness say, no, there's no heaven to go to. We are already here. We are going to live here. The only thing that is going to happen, God is going to punish the wicked ones, send them into the lake of fire, and only the Jehovah's Witnesses are going to remain here on earth. And God will live with them. The throne of God is going to relocate from heaven. It is going to come down here. And Makandiwa is also taught that message. He says, we are not going to go to heaven. Heaven is going to come down. So this one, we are living on earth. It is actually the heaven for the UFIs, for the uh, watchtowers. Now, we want to find out what is the position of the Bible regarding heaven and regarding the earth. Is there any heaven that we shall go to or there is no heaven at all? So if you are a Jehovah's Witness, all you are doing is you are worshipping so that you may live here on earth where you are already. You are already in heaven. This is your heaven. There is no heaven to go to. The only thing that is going to happen is that God is going to come here and stay here with you. But what is the position of the scripture? 
Are we to go to heaven or we are not going to go to heaven? Is there a heaven to go to or there is no heaven to go to? Hallelujah. Amen. We will not need to do some arguments over these issues. The scriptures themselves must answer those questions and leave us without a trace or a speck of doubt. Is there any heaven to go to? We are going to open the book of Matthew chapter number 25. These are the scriptures we are going to cite in order for us to understand whether we are going to be going to heaven or there is no heaven to go to. Verse number 31. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, going downwards. So we may look at those, uh, at those scriptures on the screen there in order for us to understand uh, what is going to be said. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Go back to verse number 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. So Jesus was talking while he was already on earth. But he was talking about his coming. It means he was going to go back and then come back some other time. He was going to come with the holy angels with him. He shall also sit on his throne of glory. Is he going to sit on his throne here forever? Is he going to establish his kingdom here on earth forever? Verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, the sheep, those are the ones which he is going to be putting to his right, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink, I was a stranger, and you took me in, and, and so forth. The reason why we opened this scripture, it was simply to understand that he was going to say, you should inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But still this scripture does not answer, where is this kingdom? Is it here on earth? It is, or it is somewhere else. We are going to be opening the book of first, Second Corinthians chapter four, Second Corinthians chapter number four, and we are going to seek clarification on these issues from these scriptures. Second Corinthians chapter four, uh, verse number eighteen. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now this scripture is very important to us because it already disqualifies from the issue of eternity things that are visible, things that you can see with your naked eye. As long as something is seen, it doesn't abide forever. Yes. It has to come to an end. Whatever you can write it down on any piece of paper, as long as you can look at that thing with your naked eye, that thing is not going to abide forever. Yes. So if, if we are going to be talking about this earth, this physical earth, upon which our buildings are built, upon which we live, we have to ask one question if we want to understand whether this earth is going to abide forever or it is going to come to an end. Do we see this earth? Can we see it? <laughs> if we are able to see this physical world, with our naked eyes. That is enough proof that this world cannot abide forever. 
So there is no way you can talk about eternal life on earth. Because eternal life can only happen in an environment where nothing that is seen by the physical eye can partake of that eternal life. As long as what we have is physical, that physical product, that physical object, that physical phenomenon cannot inherit eternal life. It means this body cannot also inherit eternal life yeah. because we can see it. That is why in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, from verse number 1, he switches. He started by introducing eternal life issues in chapter 4, verse 18, by simply saying, we are looking for those things that are eternal, but we must never confuse ourselves into thinking that we can go into eternal life with our cars, our laptops, our cultivators, and our dishes, basins, and cups. Because what are uh, the things that are going to go into eternal life? They are only going to be those things that the naked eye cannot see. If you are talking about the naked eye, we are talking about nature itself yeah. as an institution. Even those microscopic organisms which we can see through the telescope, they are still physical. Yeah. Because the microscope we are using to look at them is also physical. Yes. If there is something that we can see using the magnifying glass, it is also physical. Yeah. It will not abide forever. Amen. So in chapter 5, verse number 1 of Second Corinthians, the apostle says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands. Where is it? It is et eternal in the heavens, which means it is not here on earth. Now he's talking about a house. If this earthly house, ask your neighbor, which earthly house was he talking about? Was he talking about this building? What was he talking about? He was talking about what? This physical human body is the earthly house. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. Now I want you to take note of this word dissolved. We will need it later. If this body is dissolved, we don't have a problem with that. We have a building of God which is not made with human hands. It is not here, that building. It is eternal and it is in the heavens. Which means the eternal house is not here on earth. Yes. It is somewhere outside this earth. It is in the heavens. Verse number two. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Verse three. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Verse 5. Now he that wrote us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident that knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Yes. Did you hear that? We are confident that while we are at home in the physical body, as long as we are in the body of the flesh, we are confident we are still far away from the Lord. Yes. Which means if you want to be closer to the Lord, <laughs> what would you do? You would be absent from home. While you are at home in the body, you are far away from the Lord. If you want to be closer to the Lord, you must be absent from the body. 
it is actually a transaction yes. he will never run away from it Amen. so we from this scripture we understand there is no eternity that can happen while somebody is still in the flesh amen you cannot inherit eternal life when you are in the body it will not happen yes. because as long as you are in the body you are absent from the lord but if you are present in the lord you have to be absent from the body verse number 7 for we walk not by sight but we walk by faith verse number 8 we are confident i say and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the lord yes. clepens for jesus So it's a debit transaction with a credit transaction. If you are present in the body, you are definitely absent from the Lord. But if you are present in the Lord, you have to be absent from the body. We are talking about entering heaven. You will not walk into heaven with this body of infirmities. In order for us to go to heaven, we we have to walk out of the flesh first but the question is why would the lord expect us to walk out of the body in order for us to enter heaven why i don't think it's good nobody wants these kinds of teachings you want me to teach you that we shall never kudenga and greeting each other like what we did shamelessly at fm when i was still a young boy they would begin to sing dijanovara kudenga isu dijanovara kudenga then they would say dijanomore sana kudenga and would begin to greet one another like this dijanomore sana kudenga I didn't know the true gospel. I was still dead in the false gospel. Yeah. That is why I sang that song. The truth of the matter is that this body does not go to heaven. Amen. Which means this earth will not go to heaven. Yes. Because the body was formed out of the dust of the earth. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> You know I love to teach the word of God but sometimes you find it difficult to teach the truth because the people do not like to hear it. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter number 22. There are fundamental truths that I want to share with you before I start to share my message. I'm actually laying the ground for my message. This is not the message tell your neighbor. Matthew chapter 22 is a chapter that tells us about something that is very phenomenal about going to heaven which everyone except a few that have been enlightened privy to Now Jesus was preaching in the streets of Israel the teachers of the gospel of Israel were not uh, responding well to his messages they were offended So they put it upon themselves that they were going to criticize him to ridicule him and to speak evil of him if possible to prove to the people of Israel that he was a false teacher so each time they came to raise questions to him it was not so that he would clarify and make them understand the word their questions had one objective to make him foolish in front of the people So in verse 23 the bible says the same day came to him the sadducees which say that there is no resurrection and they asked him you see this verse is telling us the caliber of the people that came to ask him they are a group of religious teachers called sadducees they preach that if you die that is the end of your life there is nothing that happens after your death to you you become manure and that is the end of you that was the doctrine of the sadducees yes. so they came to ask him and what did they say in verse 24 they said master moses said if a man die having no children his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother it is true the law had this commandment 
So what is your question, Mr. Saj, you say, say, now they were with us seven brethren, and the first when he had married a wife, died, the word deceased there means died, and having no child, the word issued there means child, left his wife and his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. So they were actually coming with a question that arose from the foundation of what Jesus was teaching. You say that if people die, they are going to be raised from the dead and go to heaven. That is your message. But the problem is, in our neighborhood, a certain man had seven sons. And you know that the law says if the firstborn son dies having a wife but no child, his younger brother is to take over. He is to take over this wife and he would marry her to raise children for the deceased brother. So in our neighborhood, a man who married a wife, he died without a child. His younger brother did so until this woman eventually got married to all the seven brothers. What is the question there? So, in verse number 27, he says, And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. This is the question. In the resurrection, who shall be the husband of this woman? Jesus answered and said unto, unto them, You do a, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry, nor are they given in marriage. But they are as the angels of God in heaven. So if we are going to go to heaven, we will not have this physical body. That is basically what Jesus was saying. There will be no one to marry and there will be nobody to marry another person. We will be as angels who are spirits. They are asexual. They are neither male nor female. The body that we shall receive to go to heaven with is not this corruptible body of weaknesses. It is a spiritual body which you cannot touch with your physical hand. And that body will not be related to anyone in the natural understanding. Which means there will be no father and mother, there will be no uncle, there will be no cousin in heaven. Am I teaching somebody here? Yes. If we are talking about going to heaven, we shall go to heaven simply as God's children. You will not find some time to say, good morning, Gogo, -go, in heaven. There will be no Gogo. -go. What you are calling Gogo -go today is a physical body that is only yes. going to rot and decompose. Hebrews chapter number 9, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Give us 27. Give us 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment, it is what? Appointed that we shall die. And after we die, we shall see judgment. But we are reading all these scriptures to understand whether there is a heaven or there is no heaven. Whether we shall live perpetually here on earth or there is a heaven to be entered. And we also want to understand who is it that is going to enter heaven. Is this the body that is going to enter heaven? They sang this song which is uh, sung like this. They preach that this dead body that we have put into the grave at Mbuzi Cemetery, when Jesus returns, it shall come out of the grave to go to heaven. That is a lie, my brethren. This body is not going to heaven. This body, once it is put into the morgue, the mortuary, that is the end for this body. 
Heaven is not going to be entered with this physical body. We shall enter heaven with a spiritual body. That is the body that Jesus is coming to give us. We have read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and Apostle Paul said, We are groaning where we are in this earthly tabernacle, desiring that we should be absent, because we are confident that once we leave the physical body, there is an eternal body that is in heaven reserved for us. We need to read the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is a book that summarizes the issue of the physical body. But we shall read two more scriptures to explain further that indeed heaven exists. And those that would have uh, triumphed over evil, they are going to enter heaven. Verse number 35 of 1 Corinthians 15. It says, but some will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be. But bare grain, it may chance of wheat and of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There are physical bodies, and there are spiritual bodies. That is what this scripture is saying in verse number 40. There are celestial bodies, and then there are terrestrial bodies. Are you hearing? In verse number 41, he says, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in, in corruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is what? A spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How bad that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual. So what we have now, we have the natural, but we shall eventually see the spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. And so, and as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as the, is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. So right now we carry the body that is earthy, the body of Adam, the board that is corruptible, the board that does not live forever. But if we get born again, if we come to Christ, eventually we shall have that body which is spiritual, because that is the nature of Christ. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also be the image of the heavenly. Verse number 50. Verse number 50, what does it say? Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption, and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Can we read this scripture together? Together go. Yes, 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 yes. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
Alleluia. Amen. So, so this is the message. This is the message. We shall change this body. We shall put it off. So he was talking about those that may be found in the body upon the arrival of Christ. Let's say Christ has come right away. We are still in the body. What shall we do? He says, no, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall change this body. Yes. Even if we have found this body, we must still put it off. Yes. We are going to put this body off like we put off our clothes. We put it off like this. And when we have put it off, it will remain on the ground like this. And we are going to receive another body to go to heaven with. Yes. We must put it off. We must do what? Put it off. So there is no way you are going to escape this event. You may put it off by dying and waiting for the last coming of the Lord. But if you are found with it, you will still put it off. <laughs> yes. Hallelujah. Amen. So what shall happen to the, to the earth and everything that is in it? What shall happen? We will talk about that later. We are still proving that heaven exists. We are proving it by showing you that the things that are physical do not have a place in God. We are going to read the book of um, John chapter 14. We want to find out whether we are to go to heaven. Is there a heaven to go to or we are already in our heaven like what others are teaching? John chapter 14 verse number 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Clap hands for Jesus. Yeah. So Jesus was promising his church, his bride. There are so many places that are in God, in heaven. But Jesus was talking about going to prepare a place for us. And once he was done, he promised that he was going to come back to take us so that we may be with him where he lives. Obviously, he would not say Jesus was going to take us to the earth. Because that's where we are already. He says, in my father's house. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's continue reading this scripture. Verse number 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the father, but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. So no man cometh unto the Father. So the process of going to heaven is actually coming to the Father. It is not the Father who is coming down to live with the people, the sons. It is the sons that are to come to the Father. And the reason why Jesus said come, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. Which means Jesus being the way that leads to the Father. His purpose for coming was to show the world the way. Yes. If there's anybody who would want to come to the Father, you can't come without knowing the way. So I am the way that leads to the Father. Amen. It is not the Father who is coming here. It is you who must come to the Father. But you don't know the way. That's why Thomas said, I don't know the way. Show me the way. And the Lord said, no, I am the way. By knowing me, you already know the way. So there is a heaven to be entered, my brethren. No matter how much you may like to be deceived. But the truth is, we will not live here 
forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's read Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 13. Because of time, we simply read verse number 13. Uh, we want to understand the understanding that Abraham, Enoch, Noah, Abel, and Sarah had the understanding which apparently our dear brothers and sisters in the Jehovah's Witness have no idea about. These all died. He's talking about five people from Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 1 to 12. He mentioned five people. He mentioned Abel. He mentioned Enoch. He mentioned Noah. He mentioned Abraham. He also mentioned Sarah. So he says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, yes. but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Yes. Ah, clap hands for Jesus. It means if you have faith, you must believe that you are a stranger and a pilgrim yes. on earth. Yes. You don't want to stay here forever. A pilgrim is somebody who goes to a place for a short period of time and then he goes back to his original place of residence. So Abraham died understanding that he has no permanent place to stay on earth. He was simply a journeyman. He was a man on the move. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. But the question remains, what shall happen to our dear earth? We love the earth so much. That is why we have built so much buildings on this earth. We love it. Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, yeah. and there was found no place for them. The word them there is referring to the heaven and the earth. I may just want to explain for a minute or so the word heaven in the Bible. It doesn't usually refer to heaven, the dwelling place of God. I'll prove it with, with scriptures that the word heaven in the Bible refers to three different entities. You will need to read that word in the context of the passage of the scripture in order for you to understand whether the word heaven refers there to the dwelling place of God or other environments. The word heaven may mean the dwelling place of God where we are scheduled to go if we are justified at judgment day. Yes. But the word heaven also refers to the celestial environment, the atmospheric environment. The word heaven also refers to are the secret places that belong to God, which are above the earth, but not in heaven, the dwelling place of God. For me to prove that, let us read Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, and because of our time, we will skip verse number 2, because that is where the clarification is. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word heaven there in, in, in Genesis Chapter number one, verse one. The word heaven there, the word heaven there refers to the dwelling place of God. But I want you to look at this. God created heaven and the earth. So we already have a heaven in verse number one of Genesis chapter one. But let's read verse number five. Verse number five. And God called the light day and the darkness, he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So in verse, in, 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 in verse 1 to 5, we have the establishment of light, and God said, let there be light. There was light, and God called light day, and it was the first day. What happened in day number 2, verse 6? And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Apparently, it appears that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, 
there were there was water from the earth to heaven the dwelling place of god there was water everywhere so in verse 6 he says no let there be an open space the word firmament means an open space to divide the waters that are in heaven and the waters that are on earth verse 7 and god made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so what is this firmament verse 8 and god called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day amen so how many heavens do we have now two of them second corinthians chapter number 12 verse number 1 we now have the heaven the dwelling place of god we now also have the heaven which is the celestial environment where the planes that fly and take us from one place to another they fly through that firmament the birds fly through that firmament our tall buildings go into that firmament it is also called heaven so it is not always automatic that whenever you find the word heaven in bible it already means we are going to go to heaven the dwelling place of god no the sun the moon the stars they are planets they are objects which are said to be celestial objects when we talk about geography they are called celestial objects which means they are objects that are above the earth but not in heaven the dwelling place of god in other words they are objects that are found in heaven but not heaven the dwelling place of god but heaven the extraterrestrial environment apostle paul writes in second corinthians chapter 12 verse 1 he says it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory i will come to visions and revelations of the lord he wants to share with us the visions of the lord and the revelations of the lord which he received verse 2 i knew a man in christ above 14 years ago in brackets whether in the body i cannot tell or whether out of the body i cannot tell god knows such an one caught up into the third heaven where was he caught up the third what third heaven. which means there are levels of heavens as well verse number three and i knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body i cannot tell god knows what happened to him verse number four how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter Amen. so a man is allowed to utter that he heard some words but he is not allowed to speak those words because a man is not allowed to utter the words that he heard when he was in paradise but he can utter the words that he was in paradise <laughs> yes <laughs> the words that were spoken in paradise a man is not allowed to say them yes. but telling you that he was there he can say those words yes. who is this man that you knew 14 years ago of such an one will i glory yet of myself i will not glory but mine infirmities of such an one will i glory go back to verse number one it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord verse 5. It is not good for me to glory. Verse number 5. Of such an one will I glory. It is not good for me to to just be proud. But I think of this one I can be proud. Who is this man that you knew 14 years ago who was taken up to paradise? He was talking about himself. Yes. Yeah. But he knew that people do not believe, except they are the ones who have seen or experienced whatever God wants them to see. You always believe it if it happens to you. If it happens to another person, he's lying. So instead of him saying, I went to paradise, he said, no, no, no. Somebody went to paradise. I know him. And I want to glory about that somebody. But if we are to trace these five verses, verse 1 to verse 5, of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 we discover 
that paradise is also known as the third heaven. That is why in Revelation chapter 6 verse number 9, he doesn't talk about the souls that were in heaven. He talks about the souls that were under the altar of God. Yeah. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. The word altar there, it simply means heaven. He is so under the under heaven. If you read Revelation chapter 4, John writes what he saw when he was given special access to see what happens and what is the setup in heaven. He talks about the 24 elders and their thrones. He talks about the four beasts. He talks about he that sat on the throne. He talks about the sea of glass. He talks about the rainbow. He never mentions the altar. There is no altar in heaven. Heaven itself is the embodiment of the altar. Because the word altar simply means that is where God pardons men of their sins. Yeah. And that place upon which people's sins are forgiven, it is personified in Jesus. He is the sacrifice for our sins. He is also the high priest ordained of God yes. to be the propitiation for our sins. Amen. The reason why he says under the altar, that's where he saw the, the souls. It was because we cannot go to heaven before judgment day comes. The souls of those that die in Christ, they don't go to heaven. Yes. They go to the third heaven, to paradise. So that is the reason why he said, I saw the souls of those that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. The reason why they are in paradise it is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is not because they were fasting five days a week. No. It is not because they are giving large sums of money to the church. No. It is not because they are composing some good songs in the church. No. It is the word of God. The word of God is the passport to heaven. Amen. But before we go to heaven, we must pass through death in the flesh. We take off this earthly tabernacle, yes. we go into the next realm. The saints' spirits are held in paradise, which is also known as the third heaven. When Jesus comes, he is going to take them and bring them back here, and he's going to reward everyone in broad daylight. There is no secret entrance into heaven. If you are going to go to heaven, he's going to be in front of the people. He's going to lead them to heaven. Because nobody knows how to go to heaven. If anybody knew how to go to heaven, you would not be standing here today. Why don't you go to heaven? Ask your neighbor, don't you want to be in heaven? Why are you still here? You want to go to heaven. You don't know how to go to heaven. When we hear the word, we are acquiring the visa to go to heaven. Amen. But the visa does not take you to London. You will need the plane, the flight that will take you to London. And Jesus is that flight. Yes. Right now we are simply acquiring the visa. The time to fly is coming. We don't fly right away. So if somebody dies, they don't go straight to heaven. You don't go to heaven one one. No. It doesn't happen. The heaven and the earth fled because there was no place found for it. Go back to Revelation chapter number 20 verse 11. We are cruising at a very fast speed because I said to you, this is not the message. I'm trying to find some place to step on so that I can bring out my message. So bear with me. I'm dealing with some people who may have been... Uh, hearing lies for a long time and today may be their first time to hear the truth. So I have to bring them with me in the message. Yes. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 and I saw a great white throne. This is judgment day now. And him that sat on it from whose face the moment the Lord sits on his throne like this to judge the world what happens the heaven and the earth 
who ran away. Yeah. Why is the heaven running away? There is no place found for heaven. There is no place found for the earth. If people ask you of your physical address, your residential address, you will give us an address from the earth. Number 77, Ngunguni Street, Glenview 1. That is an address from the earth. It means if in order for you to find some place to stay, the earth provides you with, with, with accommodation, with shelter. But what happens to you if the earth is no longer able to find its own accommodation? <laughs> <laughs> Judgment is a terrible incident, my fellow brethren. Yes. This earth we are proud of, it will run away. Yes. When judgment happens, the earth will not be there. Yes. There will be no Zika or Mereki Gochi Gochi Zenda. Yeah. It will have fled from his face. Okay. He's coming with a very terrible face. Yes. There will be no grace or love in his eyes. We are talking about Jesus. Okay, let's go further. Let's just find out what happens on Judgment Day. So the heaven that the Bible is talking about fleeing away is not the dwelling place of God. That's the reason why we had gone to the other scriptures when I said there are three categories of heaven in the Bible. The first one is the dwelling place of God. That is where we are going. The second one is the celestial environment. The third one they are the secret venues, the secret properties of God that only God knows about and a few who may have found favor in his sight that he should reveal those things unto them. An example is of Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 1 to 5. So this heaven now that Revelation chapter 20 is talking about that is going to flee from the presence of God. It is not heaven, the dwelling place of God. It is heaven, the celestial environment. Yes. Per adventure, one may say you don't believe it, that this extraterrestrial environment is also known as heaven. Per adventure, you don't believe it. Let us prove it to you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, day number 1. There was the creation of light. Genesis chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. Day number 2, firmament, the second heaven, the celestial environment. Genesis chapter 1, verse 9 to verse number 11 and 12. We are talking about day number 3. That is where God commanded the waters that are below to be gathered on the hollow places and let the dry land appear and let the dry land bring forth the hair building seed whose seed is in itself. His, whose fruits are after his own kind. Yes. In verse 14, going down to 16, 17, thereabout, that is day number four. That is when the sun, the moon, and the stars were created. Are we together there? I'm trying to locate the scripture that talks about the aquatic life. Let's read Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. Because there is the mentioning of this heaven again, the celestial environment from verse 20, I think to verse 24. Let's read. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. And fowl, the word fowl means birds that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So the birds actually fly in the heaven. They fly in heaven. The eagles and the pelican and the hawk and the birds, the doves and the vouchers, they fly into the open firmament of heaven. The word heaven there again does not refer to the dwelling place of God. It refers to the area above the ground, the earth. Are you listening? Yes. So number one, if you want to go to heaven, you must acknowledge that you have to divorce yourself from this earth. And when we are talking about this earth, 
it involves your body you carry the earth wherever you go yes that is why first john chapter 2 verse number 15 it says love not the world and the things that are in the world yes he talks about the world what is the world for all that is in the la- in the world okay go back to verse number 15 Love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not in the father but it is of the world yes he's talking about the world and then he talks about lust lust is sensualities that are in the body the flesh yes So if the Bible says love not the world he is talking about everything that is concerning the flesh. Amen. All the buildings that we are seeing they are not built for your spirit they are built for your flesh. Amen. If you walk out of the flesh today you don't need an air ticket to go to Ghana. You can go to Ghana without any scent because the spirit man is not limited to the laws of nature. Yes. But the physical body is. That is why you are wearing a jacket right now. You are doing it because of the world that is where you live in. If you are to go to heaven by the time heaven is opened for people to enter, everyone who must go to heaven should have a complete divorce to the world if you are still attached to the world you would not go to heaven yes even if you leave the world but because you, the love that is inside you it is still of the world you still have an attachment to the world that's why the bible says mortify the deeds of the flesh amen to be carnally minded is death to be spiritually minded is life and peace Walk not according to the lust of the flesh for the lust of the flesh are contradictory to the demands of the spirit all these scriptures are teaching us to dissociate ourselves from the lust of the flesh are you hearing this yes this body will not go with you to heaven that is if you are going in the first place <laughs> amen So we want to verify whether uh this earth we are talking about now but before we we do that can we go back to revelation chapter 20 verse 11 we want to read the rest of the scriptures there to find out what happens at judgment day and i saw a great a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life that is the title for our message tonight it is it is called the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works the dead were judged he's talking about dead spiritually and not dead physically I wrote a book I can't remember now which one it is but if you go to a media desk they will help you in which I was defining that there are four kinds of death in this world and one person must experience three out of those deaths there is no way you can escape those deaths and you can also choose to go through four of them you can only experience three deaths out of four i'm not going to talk much about it because i've got a heavy message for you i'm going to say something and give you a scripture concerning these four deaths how many deaths do we have there are four deaths the first death is the death that happens before you are born you are born dead spiritually because you are born to the first adam that is the first death and when we talk about this death you don't choose that you want to get into it or you want to make sure that you don't go into the first death because we are born to the first adam as long as we carry this earthly tabernacle 
the body of infirmities. It means a one hour old baby who have been born an hour ago. He is already a sinner. He is already dead. Yes. Because he is born to the first Adam. What are the scriptures that justify this first death? I will give you three of them. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 21. And I also give you First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, verse 40 to 50. We read it. And I also give you uh, Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. It says, We, uh, you who were dead in your iniquities, walking after the lust of your flesh, which means even though they were dead, but they were still walking, because what died in the garden was not a physical body. What died was the spirit man. That is why after God he came to speak to Adam, he then pronounced the third death and said, you were taken out of the dust, you shall return to the dust. That is when God pronounced the third death. The third death is not actually a, a death that we can think or fear or talk much about. It is basically the separation of the body and the spirit that lives inside the body. When we go to the mortuary to collect the body, to dig it into the ground, we will be experiencing what happens in the third death. The second death happens at judgment day. Those that would not have been raised from the first death. Because there is the first resurrection and there is also the second resurrection. So everyone is born dead in the first death. But through the grace of God, God is going to reach out to his elect through the gospel. He will open their ears to believe the message of Christ. When you are being born again, you are actually being raised from the dead, yes. from the first death. You are participating in the first resurrection. So we are all born in the first death, but others will participate in the first resurrection and others will not. When Jesus comes to take his bride and to judge the world, he is coming to go into a marriage with his wife. Those who would have participated in the first resurrection, who were saved from the menace of the first death, but those who did not partake of the first resurrection, they are condemned to eternal destruction. Those are the ones who are going to participate in the second death. Yes. Okay? Is there an, another death that I've forgotten to talk about? The fourth death. I've not forgotten about it. The fourth death happens at salvation. When you are being saved. Remember when Adam died in the garden, what died was the spirit man. Yes. The physical body became alive. There is no way these two can be alive at the same time. If your spirit is dead, it means your body is alive. If your body is dead, it means your spirit is alive. They cannot be all alive and they cannot be all dead. The first Adam, the first man, the first Adam, he brought death to the spirit man and life to the body. Yes. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, brings death to the body and life to the spirit man. Yes. So the fourth death is a spiritual transaction like what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam died, but he continued to walk around. He became the father of Cain, Abel, Seth, and other children. Yes. The father of dead men, he is dead himself. When Christ comes, he dies on the cross. And after he resurrected on the, from, the, from the dead, he became the author of salvation. Those that believe in him will be raised from the Adam death. Yes. And at the same time, what Adam gave life to dies when Christ resurrects the one that was killed by the first Adam. Amen. So it happens through baptism in water. Yes. That is where the fourth death happens. I may need to read three scriptures to justify this fourth death. Because others may say, we don't believe in it. Well, I'm not going to read these scriptures to lure you into believing the truth. I'm simply going to do it so that the gospel may be thoroughly justified through scripture. 
Romans chapter 6, we are rushing because we don't have time. So we are going to need three scriptures. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 5. Can you read that scripture? Read it there. Read it from the screen. I want us to read the English Bible. Yes. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. Yes. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We cannot continue to live in sin because we are dead to sin. How can somebody say we are dead and yet he is writing an episode? Paul is writing a letter and he says, we cannot sin because we died to sin. It means he is alive in the spirit, but his body died when he got saved. Yes. The desires, the lusts of the flesh, they died at salvation. That is why people struggle with the Ten Commandments. When we say we are no longer under the law, they say it is the law which says thou shalt not kill. So if we are no longer under the law, shall we continue? So we can go around killing people. No! We don't kill people. Yes. Not because we are obeying the commandment which says thou shalt not kill. We are actually dead to killing. Yes. The one that would kill is no longer alive. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> The killer died at salvation. Yes. All that is left is a sanctified, <laughs> Amen. A, a, a forgiven child of God. When a man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Continue. We want to understand how the fourth death happens. Know ye not that so many of us as we baptized into Jesus Christ we baptized into his death. You see why people are resisting baptism? Because it is the place where the flesh dies. Yes. That's why baptism is interrogated, questioned, wherever you go. Yes. They say it's no longer necessary. Do you know why they do it? The devil knows. <laughs> Once people obey these statutes that yes. Jesus enacted for the true church that he died for, then the flesh will die. We no longer have adulterers in the church. Amen. We no longer have fornicators in the church. We no longer have liars and thieves masquerading as people that have believed the true message of the cross. Yes. Yes, verse number four. Let's read together. Go, verse number four. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Did you hear that? What happened? We are buried with him by baptism into, into death. Yes. By, it is an agent of instrumentation. Yes. It means baptism is the instrument that kills the body of infirmities. Yes. Let's read it again together, go. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Because after you die, what is the next thing? Resurrection. Yes. So when you receive Holy Spirit now, you are now resurrected. Okay? You now walk in newness of Christ. So like Christ was raised up from the dead, there is no one who should say, I am being raised up from the dead, but he does not participate in the baptism of Christ, which is the baptism of death at the cross. We partake of that baptism when we are baptized ourselves in water. Amen. I said I want to give you three scriptures that justify that the fourth death kills the body and gives life to the spirit man. This is just the first one. The second one is Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. Are we going to touch our message? I'm not becoming hesitant. Because what we need to teach is far, far, far deep. We haven't started the message. We are finding some ground to stand on. <laughs> In whom also, okay, 
go back a little bit verse number 10 we just want to find context and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power who is that head we are complete in what in Christ in Jesus Christ right verse 11 in whom in Christ also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh we put off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ the colony at the end of this scripture is there to show us that we need to exp to get an explanation as to how the body of sins is put into death verse number 12 let's read together go buried with him in baptism wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead where do we participate of this death in baptism yes first peter chapter 3 verse 19 we want verse 22 we are just reading verse 19 and 22 to get the the context first peter chapter 3 verse 19 by which he also went and preached unto the spirits that were in prison verse number 20 which sometime were disobedient the spirits they were disobedient sometime when once the long suffering of god waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. 21. The like figure whereunto unto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting off, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of jesus christ verse 22 who is gone into heaven is and is on the right hand of god angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him so let's go back to verse 21 the like figure whereunto unto even baptism that also now save us in brackets not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God. What is said in brackets there is to emphasize that the result of this death must not be a testimony that I was baptized and it ends there. We must see the answer of a good conscience toward God after you claim to be baptized, yes. after you claim that you put away the filth of the flesh in the similitude of the death of Christ through the process of the baptism of water. Because once one has died and is buried, what is only left is to see the one who has been resurrected. So what we see is, we see the first resurrection happening here on earth through the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. When you hear the gospel, the Lord opens your heart to believe it. You are baptized in water and through the laying on of the hands of the ministers that have taught the word to you, you become a, a child of God. That's the salvation that gives you the first resurrection. If you do not partake of the first resurrection, you will not also partake of the second resurrection. So in order for you to partake of the second resurrection, you must partake of the first resurrection. In order for you to partake of the second death, you must partake of the first death. So, before we close this chapter, let's read Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 again and find out what happens when the heaven and the earth have fled away from his face because of his terror. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So these are the dead because they have remained held by the tentacles of the first death which we have all inherited from the first Adam 
Fortunately, by the grace of God, those that are elected by God, whose names were written in the book of life, they were delivered from the first death through the salvation. And when they were saved, they participated in the first resurrection and they also participated in the fourth death. So there are two groups of people, the vessels of mercy created for justification. They partake of the first death. We are born in it. We are born in the flesh. We also partake of the third death, which is the spirit leaving the body. We also partake of the fourth death, which happens in the neutralization of the flesh through baptism at salvation. The vessels of wrath, the people that are created for destruction, they also partake of three forms of death. They are naturally born in the first death like everyone else. They also participate in the third death because we all also, all of us, are scheduled to have this spirit leaving the body lifeless to be buried into the ground. And the spirit goes into the second realm. For the vessels of mercy, when the spirit leaves the body, it goes into the waiting room, the paradise. For the vessels of wrath, the spirit goes into hell, waiting for judgment. So Revelation 20 is talking about judgment now. We are going to read two scriptures to find out what happens to those who have been saved from the first death, who have participated in the first resurrection. They are no longer condemned. They are now saints. They are now children of God. And while we do that, we are also reading verse 13 to understand what happens to the vessels of wrath. They are called the dead because since they were born in the Adam's death, they have not been resurrected. They have died the third death, the separation of the spirit and the body. And they've gone into hell waiting for judgment. They have remained dead people. Verse number 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Dead is apparently a place. Death had actually some, some people, some dead people which it was holding on to. When judgment is set, when the judge comes to sit on his throne, death releases the dead that are in it. And they were judged every man according to their works. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Even hell itself, it will be also destroyed. Death itself will also be destroyed. Yes. <laughs> the hell we are talking about is the place where the spirits of the condemned ones is kept waiting judgment, it will also be destroyed. Verse number 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Yes. Hallelujah. This is the end of chapter 20 of Revelation. Yes. So, are we together there? Yes. Who was bent into the lake of fire? Everyone whose name was not found, written in the book of... So this is the book of life that I intend to teach about tonight. So we now understand the second death. This is the second death. Did you see that? Did you see that the second death? Read again verse 14. Read again verse 14. And the death and the hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the second death is eternal condemnation into the lake of fire for those souls, for those spirits who uh, have not been saved from the wrath of God through the gospel. But talk about the first resurrection and the second resurrection. Read verse number 1, Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. 
and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed for a little season. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived in, and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that is part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this is the first resurrection, which also leads into the second resurrection. The second resurrection happens by way of the marriage of the Lamb. So when Jesus comes, he's coming to do two things. He's coming to judge his enemies. He's also coming to enter into a marriage with his bride, the church, which comprises of the people who have believed the word of God unto their own salvation. Have we understood it? Yes. We have one last scripture to read before we go into my message. <laughs> We want to seal the fate of this world, this earth, this physical world. Where is it going? We read Revelation chapter 20 verse 11. It says it will flee from the presence of the judge. But that does not explain in details where to, where does it flee to. We are going to get the answer from the book of Second Peter chapter number 3. From verse number 8. Yes. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack. The word slack there means the Lord does not delay concerning his promise, as some men count delaying, but is long suffering to us what not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what shall happen to the earth? Burned up. The elements that the apostle is talking about, they are the celestial objects. Yes. The sun, the moon, the stars. Yes. They shall all melt in the lake of fire. Amen. So you may love this world too much, but believe me, <laughs> this place we are walking on, it has already secured its place in the lake of fire. If you are talking about sin, what wrong has this earth done to God that it should be burned up in the lake of fire? Nothing. Yes. It has done nothing wrong. It is simply being burned up because that is what God has designed it for. <laughs> it is by God's design. Yes. So I think I have laid down my foundation in a good way. Truly, there is a heaven to go to. Those that teach that there is no heaven are not only misguided, they are blinded by the God of this world. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus light on them. They are blinded. The reason why we are gathering in such unfavorable weather conditions it is because the weather conditions are simply unfavorable for this body but the man inside does not have a favorable condition 
for hearing the word of God. Yes. Whether you are hungry or you've eaten to your fill in the body, you still need to hear the word of God for your own salvation. Amen. Are we together? Yes. Now, John chapter 3 verse 16, put it there. A lot of people think that they understand this scripture very well. I will prove to you tonight that you have not heard John chapter 3 verse 16. Read it. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. God loved this world to the extent that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him. The reason why God gave us the begotten son is so that if we believe in Jesus. Should not perish. Should not perish. But have everlasting life. We are not to die, but we are to have everlasting life. So there are two questions that I want to raise to you to prove to you that you have not yet understood what this scripture is saying. You think that it is as simple as you think it is by merely reading the literal uh, orthography of this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in the begotten son should not perish but have eternal life. The first question is, how is Jesus the begotten son? Do you understand what the word begotten son means? The Shona Bible says, Marwakada nyika nekudarwaka ipa manako manawake akanga arimumwe oga. That is not true. The word begotten there does not mean that he is the only one that is born to God. No. In order for us to understand the begotten son, we will need to read the scripture. I will read one of, just one, to show you who is the begotten son. The scripture is Acts chapter 13, verse number 30 to 33. That is the scripture that defines the begotten son. Give us, please, I want us to have a clear uh, view of the screen there. Apostle Paul was preaching in a synagogue at Antioch. He went there on the Sabbath day and after the reading of the law, the leaders of the synagogue stood up and said to Paul, if he had some words of exhortation, he was free to do so. So he stood up and he began to preach about Christ. We want to hear what Apostle Paul says so that we may understand at what stage is Jesus the begotten Son of God. Yes. He says in verse number 30, but God raised him from the dead. What happened to Jesus? Let's answer, please. I want to hear you. What happened to Jesus in verse number 30? God raised him from the dead. So he's talking about Jesus as he is being raised by God from the dead. Yes. But God raised him from the dead. Verse number 31. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God yet fulfilled the same promise unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also, let us read verse number 33 again, the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So when does Jesus become the begotten son? Somebody wants to try and answer this the question. Come, my brother. When does Jesus become the begotten son? When, when he rose from the dead. Let's clap hands for him. That yes. is the truth there. It only happened when Jesus rose from the dead. 
That is when he became the begotten son. Which means before Jesus had died, there is nobody who could believe in him and receive eternal life. Because John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. So that whosoever believes in the begotten son, yes. he should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, for those who may say, what are you saying? <laughs> Have you understood it now? Yes. That you had no clue about John chapter 3 verse 16. Yes. That is not the, the end of it. Let's go a little bit back. John chapter 3 verse 14. I'll prove to you. Because verse number 16, it begins with the word for. The word for, it means because. There is no one who can walk into your house and say, because something, 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 something. The word for means this is an elaboration on what has been said already. It means you will be a fool if you are going to teach salvation from John chapter 3 verse 16 without understanding the context upon which the word for that marks the beginning of the verse yes. was written. Yes. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Lifting up happened to Jesus at Calvary. Like Moses lifted up the brazen serpent onto the Asherah pole and he shouted to the people who had been beaten by the snakes in the wilderness, if anyone has received a snake bite, look upon the snake that I have lifted up, you will not die. So Jesus was preaching about salvation and he says, the same manner, in the same way Moses lifted up the snake that he had made in the wilderness, the same way is Jesus going to be lifted up. Why is Jesus going to be lifted up? Verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Yes. How should we believe in him after he is lifted up? Yes. That's when he comes to verse number 16 and he says, Because God so loved the world yes. that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The word because, the word for in verse 16, it is explaining the lifting up of the serpent in verse 14. <laughs> so we will not believe in Jesus if he is not lifted up. Yes. We will not believe in Jesus if he has not risen from the dead. After he has risen, God will say to him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Amen. Go back to 1330 of the book of Acts. He says, This day. If I begotten thee. First state of Acts chapter 13. Ha! The word of God. But God raised him from the dead. Give us verse 33. God had fulfilled the same unto us, the promise unto us, thy children, in that he has raised Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day if I begotten thee. What day was it? The day he was raised from the dead. Amen. Yes. The begotten son is the resurrected son. Yes. So we can only believe in the begotten son. We can't believe in the son of Mary and Joseph. That one will not save anyone. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> Give us again John 3 verse 16. Thank you. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, this scripture was supposed to be a very clear scripture. It was very, it was supposed to be a very simple scripture. <laughs> I don't know if you are seeing that it is not a simple scripture. Come. Give your bag to someone else. He'll keep it for you. Keep this bag. All right. Look. Look, for God so loved the world. 
The word world means everyone who is taking in oxygen into his lungs or into her lungs every moment. God loved the world to such an extent the word is so and that it is emphasizing the, the degree, the extent of God's love. He so loved the world that which means his love compelled him to do something. He loved the world to the extent of giving his only begotten son. Which means when Jesus was walking in the flesh, he was not yet given to the world. Because the given son is the begotten son. Now, if God gave the world the begotten son, this scripture should have said, so that the world may not perish. Yes. But you have eternal life. Because God loved the world. Yes. If he loved the world, it means he should have made sure that the world will not perish. And the world will have eternal life. Who was who who, who received the begotten son? The world was the world given the begotten son so that the world may not perish but have eternal life. No. The world was given the begotten son so that whosoever believeth not the world it is not the world that will not perish it is whosoever that believes who will have eternal life and not perish so those who preach that God wants to save everyone they are not only mad or four, they are drunk. Yeah. Because if you can comprehend a passage that was written, you actually understand that this scripture is not saying that God wants to save everyone. If you read this scripture soberly, you will discover again that this scripture is saying that there is a qualification to salvation. Am I preaching the truth? Yes. What is the qualification? Yes. Believing. Yes. Not everyone who wants to go to heaven. No. Not everyone who is afraid of death but wants eternal life. No. Everyone who meets the condition. Yes. Do you believe? Yes. If you do not believe, you will perish. But if you believe, you will not perish. Amen. So somebody may say, I believe, so I will not perish. Don't be too quick. Yes. There is another question to this condition of believing. Do we have the ability to believe on our own? If you say you believe and I do not believe, I will not argue with you over your, whether you are telling the truth or you are lying. I will simply say, give me this believing. Help me to believe. Write down the stages through which you went in order for you to come to a level where you say, I now believe. Is there a lecture that we can read or watch on how to believe? There's no such lecture. The Bible is also very clear on how do men believe the word of God. Yes. Luke chapter number 24 verse 45. How do we believe? How do mankind believe? Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You cannot believe by yourself, my dear brother or sister. Amen. It is Jesus who must open your heart to believe the word of God. You do not have the ability to believe on your own. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you understand it? Yes. Acts chapter number 16, verse 14 and 15. How do we believe? How do we believe? And a certain woman named Lydia, a sailor of purple of the city of Thyatira, 
which worshipped God had as whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. The Lord opened yes. her heart to believe yes. what Paul was teaching. Yes. No one can open his heart to believe the word of God. Yes. That is the executive function of the Messiah, yes. of the testator, Amen. of the founder and yes. president <laughs> of the church of God. Yes. Only Jesus has the keys yes. to your heart. Amen. 1348, the book of Acts. Let's start from verse number 44. We just want to find the context. The next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and speak against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light, of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Clap hands for Jesus. Who believed? Was ordained. Was it those that reason well with their minds? No. 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 You don't believe because you are good at it. You must be ordained to eternal life. If you are not, you will not believe. The one who is going to allow men to enter heaven is the one who also opens now, Romans chapter 9, verse number 9. We cannot talk about believing. We are discussing, we are teaching the doctrine of predestination. How it's already past seven. And I think that we have a two hour long message. <laughs> For this is the word of promise. At this time, will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children in brackets, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth the close bracket. The purpose of God according to election, not of works, but of him that calleth. Yes. Which means if you are going to enter heaven, it is only by the purpose of God in electing you to salvation. And when God elects people for salvation, he doesn't consider our works. He considers what he desires. Yes. Verse 12, It was said unto Rebekah, the elder Esau shall save the younger, which was Jacob. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Why did God hate Esau and loved Jacob? Is there for God a wicked God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, it is not of him that wants, yes. it is not of him that desires to go to heaven, or that yes. runs towards heaven, 
but it is of God that he showeth mercy. Yes. Going to heaven has nothing to do with what you are able to do and what you are not able to do. Amen. Going to heaven has nothing to do with what you have done in the past, whether you have done good or you have done evil. The scripture has concluded, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. That's 323 of the book of Romans. Let's not read it. Let's continue with this one. <laughs> verse number 17 for the scripture said unto Pharaoh even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardens yes what is he talking about hardening of heart if God wants to, he will show mercy. And once you believe the word, that is the greatest sign that God has showed mercy on you. He opens your heart to believe the word. But if he doesn't want to save you, instead of opening your heart to believe the word, he will harden your heart to resist the word. He doesn't leave you like that. Once he has decided he has no place for you in heaven, he will not leave you like that. He will harden your heart. Yes. He will not only resist coming to church, he will actually begin to blaspheme God, to contradict the word of God. Amen. He will not only live at home and not come to hear the word of God. No. You will sit on your computer and you will write profanities against God yes. on your Facebook account. Yes. He has hardened your heart. Amen. He doesn't harden your heart so that you become indifferent about the word of God. No, 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 no. You will not be indifferent. You will react to the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, verse number 19. Thou would say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? If God has hardened my heart to resist the gospel, why is he going to put me into the lake of fire? Who can resist the will of God? God wants me to resist the gospel. I cannot walk against that will and believe the gospel when God wants me not to believe it. Why will he burn me in the lake of fire? if he has designed me to resist the gospel. Verse number 20. Nay, but O men, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lamp to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God willing to show his anger Wrath means anger there. Yes. And to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted means designed for destruction. Yes. There are people that are designed for the lake of fire. Yes. Even here as we stand here, we have people designed for the lake of fire. Okay. Verse number 23 and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Yeah. Yeah. Prepared means it's an architectural product. When you came into this world, there is a design inside you which makes you attracted to the word of God. If that design is not there, you cannot fake it. You cannot fake it. Women can fake their pregnancies, but believing the word cannot be faked. Yes. It will eventually be exposed. This one does not believe. He is a vessel of wrath fitted for destruction. This is the doctrine of predestination. Yes. Let's read further scriptures on the doctrine of predestination. Romans chapter 8 verse 29. 
We are going to read five of them. We need them. We are going to squeeze and compress the issues that I wanted to share with you on the message of today. We are going to bring it out. Believe me. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son, that he might be the firstborn among brethren, among many brethren. So he knew us before he predestinated us to the conformity of the image of Jesus Christ. Predestinate means predetermination. Hallelujah. Amen. Something that is designed beforehand. That's what God has done. Why did he do it? Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. He doesn't call everyone. He only calls those that he has predestinated. Yes. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Okay, okay, okay. So, he goes on to say, what shall we say then? If God be for us, who can be against us? Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Because we are determined to go to heaven. Not because of our wish, our desire, our effort, our handiwork. No. God has made it possible. I said I'm going to give you five scriptures. This is the second one. Let's read the third one. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 and 5 and verse 11 as well. We need that scripture. We need it. Is it true that we are already predestinated to eternal life? Read it. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 and 5. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Yes. That we should be holy and without blame. Yes. Before him in love. Yes. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. According to what? Does he want you to go and fast in order for him to give you this predestination? No. Predestination means it happened before mankind were created. Yes. It means before Adam was created, God had already determined who he was going to save. He brought people after he had already chosen the ones that are to go to heaven. Verse number 11, read it. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who waketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Do you see the emphasis on the word his own will? Yes. He continues to talk about the will of God. Let's all just say the will of God. The will of the God. The will of God. The will of God. So, there are two methods through which the gospel is being taught nowadays. The larger chunk of the so-called preacher of the 21st century they are saying, choose Jesus and he will accept you. That's why they sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Is there anyone amongst us who wants to choose Jesus that he may become their Lord and Savior? Come to the pulpit. Jesus is ready. He's simply waiting for you to make a pick. I want Jesus. I don't want the devil. I want the devil. I don't want Jesus. That doctrine is from the pit of hell. Yes. It makes God's activities dependent on the simple, carnal, short-sighted activities that happen on planet Earth. Yes. It means God does not know who is coming to heaven. He is waiting for people to choose him. That is a fake gospel. Yes. So that teaching says you will make a choice. Salvation is on the basis of your own will. No, that is not true. Salvation is on the basis of the will of God. Amen. It is the will of God that ultimately prevails upon our lives. God's will. 
God's desire, God's choice. He did it according to his foreknowledge. Hallelujah. Amen. Are we hearing? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Let's read the book of Peter. Peter chapter 1 from verse 1. First Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Let's read the scripture together. We want to read this one together. Together go. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pondas, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Yes, verse number two. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and the peace be multiplied. He is writing to those that are elected yes. according to the foreknowledge of God. Amen. The Shona Bible says, Nekuzira jirimberi kwa mangari. Yes. Now, let's continue with our message. We want to read quite a number of scriptures. Let's read uh, Proverbs chapter 16 verse 4. Is it true that even those that resist the gospel... They were designed to do so by God. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 4. Read. Pastor the Marangi, read the Lord has made all things for himself. Let, let's read it again. Together go. The Lord has made all things for himself. Yes. Yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. <laughs> <laughs> Clap hands for Jesus. <laughs> he has made what? All things for himself. All things for who? For himself. Even what? The wicked. He made the wicked for who? For the day. Why the did evil. he do it? <laughs> for the day of evil. Of evil. Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 1. Yes. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water. Like the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. <laughs> God turns the king's heart wherever God wants. Yes. Like the river of waters. God, he manages the waters that are flowing in a river. If God wants the river to flow upstream, he will do it. <laughs> Amen. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the river of water. The same way God controls the waters in the river is the same way he controls the heart of the king. Yes. He turns his heart wheresoever he wills. If he wants Jehazael, to come and devour the pregnant women, he will do it. Yes. If he wants Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the temple, he will do it. He is in charge. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. This is the doctrine of predestination. But this is the beginning of my message. Remember the former things of old. Remember the former things of old. For I am God. I am God. And there is none like me. And there is none else. Yes. I am God. And there is none like me. There is no one like God. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. There is no regulatory authority yes. that monitors the office of God to say, no, God is now becoming excessive. We yes. must control him. Let's take God to the constitutional court. We want to approach a potras <laughs> so that potras may find God over what he's doing. No. I declare the end before. The word from there, it means before. Yes. Before the beginning. From the ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Yes. Who is going to believe the word? God has determined that already. 
Before Amen. Adam was formed, yes. he had already written the book of life. Amen. So someone may say, in that case, God is not fair. <laughs> because he is making sure that we, we don't believe the gospel. Why is it that when I say there are people who are meant to believe and those that are meant to resist, he always go to the side of those that are meant to resist. <laughs> Your sixth sense seems to be feeding you yes. the right information. Yes. <laughs> I never said this one is written in the book of life. This one is not. I'm just saying there are people who are already written in the book of life. But in your mind, you are already saying, he is saying I am not in the book of life. Why are you saying that? <laughs> your instincts are warning you. Ask your neighbor, why do you believe that you are the one not written in the book of life? Why don't you believe that you are the one? Yes. Your heart will tell you. If you are not written in the book of life, your heart will tell you. Clap hands for Jesus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah. It's a good message, isn't it? So it is. Wonderful. <laughs> so let me tell you. The issue of salvation will be summarized in two examples. In how many examples? Two. Two of them. The first example is in the Bible. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them who had not sinned in the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of the one that was to come. The scriptures are too plenty, too numerous to mention. We have read them all over and every time. We are born, all of us, we are born sinners. And God says, I want to give this one eternal life. This one I don't. And people begin to castigate God, to question the will of God. Why is he not saving everyone? Believe me, that is not only shallow way of seeing God. The first position is, if we are all born sinners, it means we are all deserving to perish in the lake of fire. Yes. It, it means even if all of us are to go to the lake of fire, God is just and God is fair. Yes. Do we agree on that one? Yes. So out of the list of those that are going to the lake of fire, deservedly so, God then says, this one will not go to the lake of fire. Do those that are not picked by God have the right to say to God, why have you not chosen me? No. If somebody comes here and gives this brother of mine $50, he comes here and says, blah, 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 $100. He comes here and says, which one, which one, which one? $5. And he comes here to these people and says, what, 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 what? $2,000. Do we take him to court? No. For not giving those that he has not given? No. Do you deserve this money in the first place? No. You don't. That's what God is doing. <laughs> He's Amen. giving a special gift yes. to a few people in the midst of a great multitude who are worthy of condemnation. And he says, I have chosen this one I have chosen this one. You don't have a right to go to heaven. All of us. He is choosing those that he wants to save. And when the gospel is taught, that is the place where we see this one is chosen, this one is not. We don't need to see the book of life. No. But I've spoken about the book of life, the book of life, the book of life, the book of life, the book of life. It appears as if somebody who is new here will say, but we haven't read a scripture that mentions the book of life. We have read one. Revelation chapter 20, verse 13 to 15. Those that were not found in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. But who are they that are written in the book of life? When was the book of life written? If right now Jesus is still writing new names into the book of life, then you only need to meet Jesus and bribe him into writing your name as well.
give him some few offerings. I promise I'll be giving you after every month end, I'll give you some dollars. Please write my name in the book of life. I want to go to heaven. I will not come down from this Gomagura mountain until you give me some assurance that you have written my name in the book of life. Somebody smoking weed behind another rock in the mountain who answer you, go home, I have written it. And you come home and say, he said it, I heard the voice saying he has now written my name in the book of life. You are deceived by marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> the book of life Revelation 17 verse number 8 we are straightening the gospel up we are challenging the status quo which gives men power over God God waiting on the table like an abandoned piece of bread waiting to see who is going to care about him to come and pick up the piece of bread and shove into his mouth no God does not operate like that. He is doing all things. Yes. Revelation 17 verse 8. The beast that thou sowest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is and is not when was the book of life written from the foundation of the world which means before the foundation of the world yes let's read the book of luke chapter 10 verse 20 let's begin at verse number 19 luke chapter 10 verse 19 and 20 behold i give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He was sending his ministers to preach to the streets, the people of Israel. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen. It means... He has not come to find new people to add onto his list yes. that is already in heaven. No. <laughs> you are written already. The word written is in past tense. It means it happened a long time ago. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. The book of life, the book of life. Revelation chapter number 21 verse 27. Read it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever waketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. They which are written in the Lamb's book of life. life. Let's read Revelation chapter 13 verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Philippians for Jesus. <laughs> Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 3. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, he hope those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Life. Amen. Mm. There is a scripture that I may not have wanted to read because of our time, but we need to hear it. Psalm 139, verse 1 to 13. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Yes. God understands our way of thinking afar off. Yes. Verse 3. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. Yes. You understand them perfectly well. The way I walk, you understand it well enough. So there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, 
O oh Lord, thou knowest it all together. Before we say anything, Amen. God knows it all together. Yes. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. You know my behind, you know my friend. Yes. You know what happened before me, you know what shall happen ahead of me. Yes. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. <laughs> Clap hands for Jesus. Yes. Verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning and it go in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. <laughs> when God sees things that are in darkness and sees things that are in light, they look the same unto him. Darkness is only difficult for us. God sees clearly in yes. darkness. Yes. Verse 13. <laughs> For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Possessing his reins, it means he is holding the faculties of the writer. This was Jesus speaking. He was speaking about the control of God over his assignment here on earth. When Jesus is angry, God has made it to be like that. He is in control of the faculties of Jesus. With such power over this world, can there be somebody with some authority over his own life, with some power, some, some platform to choose whether he wants to go to God or whether he wants to go back to the devil? Today, you believe the gospel, you listen, you attend to it, you obey it. Tomorrow, you go back to your beer, you go back to your thieving, you go back to your lies. So, in each case, God will be writing your name and deleting it from the book of life. No. <laughs> when you say, write my name in the book of life, you are instructing God to search for his bow point. And they say, give me my book. Nimrod has instructed me to write his name in my book. <laughs> when you reject God, God says to his angels, bring me the rubber. Give me the tipex. I want to delete his name. He has gone back to his beer. What kind of a God is that? We don't worship yes. such an imagined God. Yes. Ours is the sovereign God of heaven. Amen. He holds the yam. He holds the knife. Yes. Are we together? Let us stand up to our feet. We are now dwelling into our message. We are now beginning to see the message. Let us open the book of Exodus chapter 28. That is where our message is coming from. <laughs> Even if we are going to spend 20 minutes with the message, the foundation we have laid for this law will give us a perfect understanding of the doctrine of salvation, the book of life, in connection with the work of the high priest. What we are going to learn tonight is the work, the garments of the high priest. We are going to discover predestination, the book of life, in the function of the high priest. After today's message, you will be left with no doubt that God is not looking for people to save. He already knows those that are his. I am holding on to one of my favored scriptures concerning salvation, predestination in the book of life. I will show it to you very soon. Take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, 
that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Itama, Aaron's sons. Go ahead. Give me verse number 9. I just wanted us to understand uh, that Moses was getting instructions from God regarding the priest and the high priest. The priest and the high priest, Aaron and his sons. And thou shalt take two onyx stones and grave on them the names of the children of Israel. Six of their names on one stone and the other six names of the rest on the other stone according to their birth. Two onyx stones. You must inscribe the names of the children of Israel. They are twelve in number. Six on one onyx stone. The rest, the remaining six on another onyx piece of stone. Verse number 11. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold. Verse 12. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the effort for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. So the two onyx stones were to be put on Aaron's shoulders or attached to his effort. They shall be, Aaron shall carry the names of the children of Israel on his shoulders for memorial every time he stands on the golden altar in the sanctuary to bear incense before God every time he appears on, on the day of Yom Kapeh, which is the day of atonement, on the tenth day of the month of Tishira, the seventh month of Israel, to atone for their sins. He must present himself with these two onyx stones hanging over his shoulders as he bends the blood of the goat. Yes. To appease for their sins. Okay, 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 okay. Read verse number 15. We are going to read down to verse number 30. We are going to see an image very soon of how these things are. So the two onyx stones were attached to his shoulder like those, um, those rank markers on the uniform of our soldiers and police officers. That's what God was instructing Moses to do with the garment of Aaron, the high priest. Not everyone, not every priest. It was only done on the garment of the high priest. Yes. Thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. It must be the work of an expert. An expert must expertly design a breastplate of judgment after the work of the effort thou shalt make it of gold of pure and of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine twined linen shalt thou make it four square it, it shall be being doubled a span shall be the length thereof and a span shall be the breadth thereof thou shalt set it in settings of stones even four rows of stones. How many children did Jacob have? So, the two onyx stones had the twelve names of the children of Israel. The breastplate was expected, instructed to carry the twelve special stones, each piece of stone representing one child of Jacob. It was supposed to be part of the breastplate of judgment which the high priest wears on his chest as he performs the order of divine service in the temple. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, a kibinko, four rows, the first row con containing three special stones, sardius, topaz, kibinko, this shall be the first row. The second one shall be an emerald, sapphire, and diamond. 
The third row, a liga, an agate, and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their closings. Yes, let's go. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel. Twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, everyone with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of red the work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and shalt put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And shalt, thou shalt put the two red the chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two red the chains thou shalt fasten in the two ouches, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the effort before it. Thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate, in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the four part thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the curious ghetto of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof, unto the rings of the effort with the lace of blue, that it may be above the curious gate of the effort, and that the breastplate be not loosed from the effort. And the Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart, when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Verse number 30. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Orim and the Tumim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall be the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. So I want you to give me that image with a lot of explanations written. The image of the high priest with descriptions of everything that he was putting on. Put that picture on the screen. We want, we want everyone to see that image so that we may explain this issue of the book of life predestination with a good understanding. Yes, can you zoom it? Can you zoom it? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, it's okay. You can zoom it so that it can diminish other things. We just want to concentrate on these two. Those are the things that we want to concentrate on. So, before you do that, are you seeing this image? <laughs> this is, this is Aaron. This is Aaron. This is the high priest. And this is the high priest's garment. And this one is the effort. From here to there, this is the effort. This is the ghetto or a sash which he would bind his loins with to make sure that his garment does not go uh, out of order and also that his, his effort will remain in its place. This is the effort that was demanded by David from Abiata when he wanted to pursue his family to those Amalekites who had touched down Ziklag and his, his village. Now, these are the special stones which are at his heart according to Exodus 28. This is the breastplate of judgment. The golden rings are, are tied here to make sure that the breastplate does not fall down or does not move sideways from its original position as instructed by the word of God. So these are the, the, the sardias, sardias, topaz, kubinku, emerald, sapphire, diamond, ligand, agate, amethyst, beryl, onyx, jasper. So these are four rows of three columns. Do you see that? So obviously, when we look at this, we see that the first one could be representing Reuben, the other one Simeon, the other one Levi. And on these two onyx stones, 
that are also attached to his effort, but on the shoulders. We also see the other one, two onyx stones, each one has engraved six names of each tribe of Israel. This is where we read Exodus chapter 28, verse 9, 12. They are for memoria. This breastplate containing the engravements. So each stone had an engravement of each name of the 12 tribes of Israel. Reuben, it was not written with some ballpoint, with some ink. It was engraved into the special stone. Something that is engraved cannot be deleted. You cannot delete an engravement. Yes. Can somebody show me a coin? I want to explain something concerning predestination, justification, using a coin. No, this coin is written fifth, which means it's 50 cents. Are you hearing? Yes. But this is not some ink that they used. It is an engravement. Yes. It is a superscription. It is an inscription. You cannot take any ink to delete what is written on this coin. This other side is written 2017 with a B and an Arab Z inscription inside. This one is written also bond coin 50 cents. There is nothing you can virtually do to this coin to change what is written on this inscription. Yes. Are you listening? Yes. Are you listening? Yes. Now, these are the garments of the high priest. He goes into the Holy of Holies dressed like this. He doesn't take this one. This one is the incense of fragrance. He uses it in the sanctuary. But when he goes into the Holy of Holies, he carries a certain uh, metal which is like a pan carrying some coals and a certain jar in which uh, there is the blood of atonement. So he goes into the Hall of Holies to burn. If we had time, I could have shown you the picture. We have got it, but we can't because of our time. We want to settle for this image. So the reason why the Gentiles were not allowed to partake of the Old Covenant, it was because the high priest, when he goes in, in, into the Yom Kape, Yom Kape is written as Y-O-M. Hallelujah. Amen. Kape is K A double P U R. That is the Hebrew word for day of atonement. He does that so that he may present blood for the salvation of his people. Aaron must carry the nation of Israel at his heart in order for him to atone for their sins. Are you hearing this? Yes. So what Aaron does is, he does not go into the Holy of Holies. He burns blood for their forgiveness. And then he comes out of the Holy of Holies. And then he says, is there anybody who wants his sins to be forgiven? No. Because when he presents blood before God, God must know the list of the people that are to be forgiven yes. through the blood that he has presented. Yes. Ah, you are not hearing Amen. it. Amen. <laughs> you are not hearing it. You are not hearing it. No. We are preaching the gospel. And a lot of people think that we are looking for people who may like our message to believe it. So that if they wish, they may choose to follow Jesus. And if they have chosen Jesus, Jesus will accept them to give them eternal life. Meaning to say that when he appeared before God as our high priest after he had risen from the dead, he appeared as a high priest with no name on his priestly garments. If Donald believes in Jesus, Jesus will now write Donald's name on his breastplate. Amen. That is Amen. not the order, Amen. my beloved brethren. 
the Amen. high priest must make the engravements yes. before he goes into the Holy of Holies Amen. to appear Amen. before God for the sins of the world. Yes. Ah, make a loud shout of noise. Glory unto yes. Jesus. <laughs> When he appears before God, he must be reading the engravements. Yes. And he says, forgive Reuben, Lord. Forgive Simeon, Lord. Forgive Judah, Lord. Forgive Dan, Lord. Yes. Forgive Naphtali, Lord. Forgive Zebulun. Forgive Joseph. Forgive Benjamin. Forgive Asia. <laughs> forgive Isaac. Amen. He must be reading the names already engraved mm, yes. at his heart. Yes. Ha, I don't know if you are hearing this. So the salvation program was completed before the world was formed. Yes. That is why the Bible says the lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. When Jesus appeared before God, if he had no names on his effort, he is a pathetic high priest yes. who is out of order. It means he violated his own scripture. What the law is talking about, Aaron, it was not about Aaron. Remember, the law was a shadow yes. of good things that are to come. Jesus yes. is the high priest ordained of God with an oath. And the Lord is so and do not repent, saying unto Jesus, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. So when, when we see Aaron wearing these garments, we are not seeing Aaron. We are seeing the pattern of the priesthood of Christ. Yes. Are you enjoying the message? Yes. You know, the rain wanted to threaten us. <laughs> Let's clap hands for ourselves. <laughs> We were, we were resilient in and out of season. Ask your neighbor, are you still here? Listen to me, my brother. Listen to me. Okay, okay. Before I talk, I want to open a scripture. It's a very important scripture because it talks about these stones. It talks about what? Yes, yes, yes. It talks about these stones. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be you have tested that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming is unto a living stone. The Lord himself is coming, but he is a living stone. Do you understand this? Yes. This allowed indeed of <laughs> men, but chosen of God and precious. Amen. You are not hearing it? <laughs> Amen. This is the stone that was rejected by builders. Yes. It became a chief cornerstone. Yes. So the names, the names, <laughs> the names of the, the saints who are to be saved, they are not written on a piece of sweet potato. Yes. They are not written on a piece of batatis. They are not written on a mukonde with sadza. They are written on special stones. <laughs> So the Bible always talks about the book of life. Yes. They don't understand that the book of life is also a stone. Yes. So we are not written in some other separate book. We are written in Christ. Yes. We are written in Christ. He is the precious stone. Chosen of God. The living stone. Amen. Amen. Yes. We are engraved in Christ. <laughs> what has happened? We are engraved. No one will delete any engravement. An engravement is something that no amount of two can delete it without damaging the stone itself. 
The fact that the names of the 12 patriarchs were engraved on the precious stones, it is there to give us a clue how it is impossible for the elected one of God not to enter heaven. Yeah. Nothing can happen to the one that God has chosen yeah. so that he may fall from grace. No persuasion can lure them into believing a false gospel. Amen. Because the names of the elect are not written on some piece of paper. They are engraved on stone. Yes. They are part of Christ. Amen. They are engraved inside Christ. Amen. <laughs> and what happens with the process of engravement? You cannot engrave something on, onto something without causing pain to the something. Yes. <laughs> if there is going to be any engravement on gold, Gold must suffer pain. Amen. It must lose some pieces, some powders, some fine particles in order for the engravement to last. You cannot engrave anything onto any metal, any mineral without causing some pain onto the mineral. Yes. So Jesus was humiliated. He was wounded. He suffered. Because it was necessary for the engravements to be established. When we preach to you, we are showing you the engravement. Amen. When you see Christ through the gospel, you discover your name engraved into him. And you say, I have seen my name. I won't walk out on Jesus. Yeah. Because I have seen my own engravement on his body Amen. in the gospel. To whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Verse number five. You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by. Because the stones are attached Onto the garment of the high priest. Yes. Are you hearing this? Yes. So, I don't fret. I don't panic over those who all of a sudden decide not to come and hear my message. I don't have pressure on how many people are going to attend our ministry. Yes. I don't have a problem. If you don't like this message, go somewhere else where you like. Yes. Because my mission is not to bring new people to Jesus. Amen. That is not my mission. <laughs> <laughs> there is not even one new person that I shall bring to Christ. Yes. No, 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 no. I'm simply discovering the engravements. Amen. This one is engraved. Amen. That one is engraved. This other one was engraved. When did it happen? Before the foundation of the world. Amen. Ah, clap yes. for Jesus. <laughs> Give us back the image. We are working with an image this evening. <laughs> you see now that it was necessary. To have laid the foundation we have laid for long. Yes. Before we came back to the message. Now, look at this picture. Look at it. You must see two things. You must see two things. The stones are on the breastplate of judgment. Which is hanging or which is attached to the high priest's heart. I want to read a few more scriptures in Exodus 28. Very important they are. Exodus chapter 28, right, verse 27. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the two sides of the effort underneath, toward the four part thereof over against the other, coupling thereof above the curious gate of the effort. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof under the rings. Verse number 29. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. When he goeth in unto the holy place, 
for a memorial before the Lord continually. So the names of his church, you know, when, when Aaron presented himself before God, God was not seeing Aaron. He was seeing the whole church because he carried Israel on his heart. Amen. So Aaron was Israel and Israel was Aaron. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which means when we are eventually going to walk into heaven, that will not be the first time God is seeing us. <laughs> Amen. As long as the high priest is before God, God is not seeing the high priest alone. He is seeing the whole congregation. Amen. It is at his heart. Chokwa. The congregation for which the high priest is appearing before God, it is at his heart. So God is not going to say, oh, oh, where, where are you coming from? Who are you? No! He saw you in Christ yeah. when Christ appeared before God on your behalf. He has seen every one who is written in the book of life. Because Jesus is the book of life. It is a rock kind of a book. Unfortunately, when we read the word book, we thought it was made of paper. <laughs> <laughs> the book is not made of paper. Yes. It is made up of precious stones. It is a rock that was disallowed by the people, yes. but it was glorified by God. So Jesus is not looking for new people to save. He already has their names on him. Now, give us back, uh, before you give us the picture, can you give us um, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Yes. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man Jesus, because he continued forever, had an unchangeable priesthood. Yes. Wherefore he is also to save them to the uttermost to save them to the uttermost, to save them to the last degree. There is no sickness, there is no weakness in your character that Jesus will say, I wanted to save you, but you are a thief, I can't help you anymore. He is able to save them to the uttermost. Yes. There is no weakness that shall remain in you forever. Amen. As long as your name is on the breastplate Amen. of Amen. the high priest. Yes. It's not possible. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession forever. Amen. You see that this scripture is telling well with Exodus chapter 28, yes. verse 29. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. And when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Give us back that scripture in Hebrews chapter 7 again. Give us verse 25. Wherefore he is able to save them, to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he forever liveth to make intercession for them. Yes. Do you see the connection? Yes. Exodus chapter 28 verse 29 and Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. The priest stands before God continually. Christ intercedes for them continually. He is forever alive. Are you hearing this? Yes. Give us back the image. Let us conclude the message. Now, why did God not allow the breastplate to be to his back? Could it each breastplate? Why did he not instruct Aaron to put it on his thigh? Why at his heart? Because the heart represents two things. Number one, 
it means this is what touches him most. He is attached of everything that the, the high priest put on the breastplate was his favorite. Yes, yes, yes. Everything else that he could be found doing, but the breastplate was his most desired attire. Amen. The names of his people are what he was ready to lay down his life for. Amen. No other man can do this that a man can lay down his life for the sake of his friends. Yes. That's what he said in John chapter 15. Yes. And in John chapter 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sake of his sheep. It means Jesus loves us so much. We are at the center of his heart. Yes. He was willing to be humiliated for the sake of his people. Amen. The breastplate does not contain Prados and Range Rovers. The breastplate carries yes. the name of people that he has come to save. Amen. He loves you, my dear. He loves you, my friend, my yes. brother, my sister. Jesus loves you. He was, he was willing to die to make you a child of God. The second thing that this breastplate represents, it also represents focus of any part of his body. The easiest place to look at at any time, it is his chest. Whenever he bows down his head, before he speaks to God, because bowing down represents worshipping. Before he says any word to God, when he bows down, he worships. Because everyone who came to Jesus, they bowed down as a sign of worshipping. And worshipping is essentially pleading a cause on behalf of some people. The high priest bows down to worship God so that he should forgive his people. He looks at the breastplate. He will not forget even one of his own. He knows all of his sheep by their names. Hallelujah. Amen. The love of God personified in Christ. We experience it. We taste it every day. When we hear the gospel, he makes sure when his word is given to a minister that he has recruited to share the message of his sufferings, he makes sure every sermon, every teaching, it is addressing everyone written on his breastplate. Which means there is not even one sermon we should say, the sermon that the minister preached today, I didn't benefit me. I think I will try to listen to his sermon tomorrow. I think he was meaning to address other believers and not me. No, every message, it addresses all his people. Amen. Because when he delivers a message, he considers those that are at his heart. You are at his heart. Jesus does not hate you. Contrary to what we are hearing from our today's preachers, that Jesus is so hard-hearted that if you fall sick, he will not heal you until he receives some dollars from you. No! When he stood before God to atone for your sins, he had not received a dime from your pocket, Amen. your purse, or Amen. from your wallet. He did it out of his own love. Yes. Jesus loves you unconditionally. You are the elect of God. When you speak to him, you are not speaking to a stranger. Jesus knew you before you knew him. If there's somebody who must speak more between you and Jesus, it must be Jesus teaching you about himself. Yes. Because he has accomplished some great works for you, which works you have no idea about. Amen. You are supposed to learn about the functions of the high priest. Let's go to the onyx stones that are carrying the two, the two groups of the names of the children of Israel. We are seeing Aaron representing the children of a physical Israel. 
because Christ is a high priest ordained of God. He represents the spiritual Israel of God whose names are written not on this piece of stone which is corruptible, but they are written in Christ, in God, in heaven. Yes. That is what Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 18 says. But I want you to look at these two onyx stones on his shoulders. The shoulder represents power. You can't do anything with your hand if your shoulder is broken. Yes. Are you hearing this? Yes. That's why Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says, The government shall be upon his shoulder. So the breastplates, no, the onyx stones, the two onyx stones that have the uh, engravements of six sons of Israel each that are tied to his effort on his shoulders. They represent the gospel of grace and faith, which is scheduled yes. to deliver a specific people. The gospel is not coming to save anyone. That's why no matter how different these names are written, and yet these two breastplates did not differ in size. The word Judah is smaller than the word Naphtali. The word Levi is smaller than the word Zebulun. And yet, the two onyx stones did not differ in size to accommodate different sizes of words that comprised of the names of the patriarchs. Yes. Which means the gospel was created like a designer suit. What do they call it? You go to a factory, they take your sizes and they make a suit specifically for the sizes that you have provided to them. So when we preach the gospel, <laughs> the gospel of grace and faith It carries the power of God. Amen. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Yeah. It is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. To them that believe. To the Jews first. And to the Greeks. But even though the word of God is the power of God. Not everyone will believe it. A specific people who are engraved on the breastplate. Yes. They have their names fitting onto the onyx stones. Yes. That is why when we preach the gospel, there are some people who say, no ways there is no such kind of a gospel. Because if you write the names of the Philistines on these two onyx stones, they are too long, they will not fit onto Aaron's shoulder. Yes. Because the onyx stones cannot be too long to the extent of overlapping his shoulders to this place. It means the onyx stones are bigger than the shoulder of thy priest. And yet the shoulder of thy priest must carry the stone ex instead of the stone hanging precariously on the shoulder of thy priest. He must carry them and as he carries them on his shoulder he is preaching that I am able to suffer I am able to provide all things that the elect require in order for them to enter heaven. Let all the burden come upon my shoulder. You are not required to bring anything, yes. to do anything, to put any effort for your salvation. As he walks around carrying the names on his shoulder, and I should that he will be showing off, telling the people. I am able to carry them. He carried the nation of Israel on his shoulder. Every time he appeared before God, he was telling God, they are my burden. Amen. Don't ask anything from Rhoda. He is my burden. She is my burden. Yes. They are my burden. Yes. He carries them on, on his shoulders. All of them but in today's messages, it is no longer the high priest carrying the people. It is the people carrying Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> the priest plates are now carrying the priest. That's why if we preach that we don't give tight, they say, how shall the work of the gospel progress? We are carrying the word of God. We are carrying the work of the gospel. That's why we are providing our tithe. It was not meant to be you carrying the gospel yeah. to the nation. It is Jesus who empowers you. It is Jesus who carries it when he is inside you and you are inside him. Yeah, the work is done and perfected in the high priest. That's why we don't have a program for any year. Ask those that come to our ministry. We have no theme. We have no target. That by the end of year 2018, we must have filled the church which are with how many people? That's not our burden. The names are already written on the attire of the high priest. What is our worry? You want to fill the church with the people. Where do you want to take them? Ask your neighbor, where do you want to take them? Do you see predestination established clearly yes. on the two onyx stones and also on the, the breastplate yes. that is attached to the garment of the high priest, the breastplate of judgment? What is it called? The breastplate of it means judgment that is supposed to go to the people was meted on the high priest. He is the one who carried our judgment. We are no longer condemned. We are now justified. Yes. The judgment that was deserving us because we were born sinners. Christ suffered. It came upon him. That is why it is now called the breastplate of judgment and when we appear before the judgment seat of christ at judgment day we are no longer going to be judged yes. because judgment was done already it was reminded of him through the breastplate that he amen. carried each time he appeared before god amen when we appear before the judgment seat of christ we are not appearing there for the sake of our condemnation he is going to acquit us to vindicate us, to justify us, yes. to glorify us. We are going to be acquitted, pronounced innocent, pronounced pure and righteous, enter heaven, yes. which was designed for you from the foundation of the world. The reason why you are going to burn, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm sure I'm talking to somebody, and somebody is here, and all that, those that are going to hear our messages on SoundCloud, the reason why they will burn you to the lake of fire, it is not because you are smoking today. There is no engravement of your name on the breastplate of the high priest. That is the reason why you are resisting the gospel. That is why you get angry when you hear the true message coming out. If we lie to you, you jump with ex exhilaration. But when you preach the true gospel, you get offended. Your name is not written on the breastplate of the high priest. The high priest must have engravement first before he goes to appear before God in the Hall of Holies. What begins is inscriptions of the name of his people. And then he walks before God. Chakatanga kunyoro kama zita. Mupresita ozono mira. Aine mazita kari. The gospel is not looking for people who sympathize with it. No. The gospel is simply searching out for those who have not known that the high priest has already accomplished some great wonderful works on their behalf. We are reminding you. We are notifying you. You are busy drinking beer here. The high priest has finished his work. We saw your name on the breastplate. 
The name is inscribed on the engravement. Your name is there on the attire of the high priest. Come and celebrate eternal life designed for you. And if your name is truly there, you will come. And you will not say, I want to choose Jesus. No! The engravement happened before you came. So the one who engraved your name is the one who chose you. You have not chosen him. Let's read our final scripture, John chapter 17. That was the scripture I was holding on to. It is a super scripture. Let us stand up for those who are sitting down. Okay. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Yes. As, as, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Amen. Amen. Yes. Verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. All, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Yes. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. They, and they have kept thy word. Amen. You see Jesus complaining there no. that the people are resisting his word. No. no. He says, no, I think the, the people that have received the gospel, they are already yours. He only gave them to me. And because they are yours, they have kept your word. He's not saying, receive the word of God. If you don't, you perish. I'm warning you. No! The engravements were done a long, long time before you knew about this gospel. He is glorifying God for those that he was given. And it is because they have kept the word of God that Jesus has discovered that they belong to God. Because they kept your word, they are yours. Let's go ahead. Verse 7. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. I don't pray for the economy of Zimbabwe. Yes. I don't pray for Chinamasa, the Minister of Finance. I pray for those that thou hast given me, yes. for they are yours. Yes. Verse number 10. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. Verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of this world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Yes, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Yes. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, 
I am not praying for Peter, James, and John, and others alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their way. He also prayed for us. Ah, let's give thanks for Jesus. He also prayed for us. But before we jump, <laughs> there is something very important in the scripture. I do not pray for these ones alone, but for everyone also who shall believe. It goes back to the issue of, and it is him who opens the heart for them to believe. Who shall believe on what? On me through their way. Yes. So if, if you believe on something else, you know, this scripture has put some antivirus. We must believe on Jesus through the word that was preached by the early preachers. Which means the early preachers have been given as a check and a balance to the message that shall be preached after they are all gone. Amen. If Guti is preaching something that differs from what Peter preached, Jesus says, I'm only praying for those who shall believe on me through the message that Peter and the crew are going to preach. Yes. So my message must concur with what Peter preached yes. in order for you to become part of the beneficiaries to this prayer. Amen. If my message is new to the Bible, it is definitely a wrong one. Amen. Through their word. The word there is referring to the early apostles. Our messages must bow down to their message. Amen. It must submit to their testimony. Yes. It cannot vary. Peter said, repent and everyone of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ yes. for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is their way. If there arises somebody today who says Peter is wrong, run away from that person. Amen. Yes. Run away. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. So salvation is complete in Christ. There is no one who shall resist the gospel in a manner that shall give Christ a headache. No. There is nobody who shall believe the gospel that shall make Christ to get surprised. No. There is no surprise. He knows everyone by their names. How before Gamjira Shoko Jesakat? Ah, Prita Tedeuka. Marangi tell you, what are you going to say? I don't want to go to the show. Pretty. But I quit your pretty Joe's foot. Just what you John? We are a bronco, a man. Marines, why is it? Tika Panika. John Attendu. Maru to Santori, in fact. Talk to him. A pretty one is well. So the children go, you could not tell you. Could Ampolness say, Amen. Run your Bible. Salvation was ordained in God before the world was formed. We are walking in a marked delay. Everyone who shall join the gospel train, it is known in God. God has the papers for that person. That's why there's no reason why we should chase you out of the church or lure you into the church. The gospel will chase you if you are not inscribed, if your name is not engraved on the breastplate. The gospel will lure you if your name is engraved. Once you are part of the elect, when you hear such a message like this one, you will feel drawn to God by this message. You don't need to be given some biscuits by the church in order for you to continue coming to church. No. If they don't prophesy, we will go. Go today. Please don't come back. The names are engraved already. Hajinganan. He woke up in a church, Hajinganan. It will not represent the book of Hajinganan. Lift up your hand and I will pray. Father, we thank you for such a wonderful message. We thought that people are added to God 
because of their way of thinking they are accepting the gospel because they are passionate about it they think well they are sober minded but the message that we have heard tonight it has taught us that we were wrong before the message is preached the high priest must go before God present himself without spot and blemish and offer blood for their atonement and when he does that he must already have names engraved on his breastplate so that when he comes out he calls out their names and explain to them the finished works that has already happened in the whole of Wallace. We were known in God before the world was formed that God was going to reach out to us and teach us the message of salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for reaching out to us. We are forever indebted to you to just say thank you for the well, wonderful works you are doing. Not only did you die for us at Calvary, you also sent us Holy Spirit as if that was not enough. You have also sent us your servants that they should declare to us what you have already accomplished to their ignorance. Thank you, Jesus. We are now acquiring knowledge about these finished works. We submit to this grace. We honor you. Amen. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ.